have with us Tenmohi Sondarajan, who is somebody that I've really been looking forward to hearing all evening today. She's the executive director of Equality Labs and a Dalit American artist and technologist. Through her work, she organizes communities to fight impunity, state violence, anti-blackness, caste apartheid, and religious intolerance. Her work has been recognized by the Robert Rochberg Foundation, Producers Guild of America Diversity Program, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and Magnum Foundation. Today, she will provide us insights into how we can make privacy work for the most marginalized communities in a world where the biggest technology platforms are concentrated in Silicon Valley, but their actions affect all of us. Then Mohi, if I could please invite you to take the floor. Sure, Jay Beam, and good evening, everybody. Um, so I think that, you know, part of what I wanted to speak to today is that in many ways, I think that when we are looking at Silicon Valley companies and how they operate in India and throughout South Asia, I think in some ways they're, they are acting as entities that have like happened to hundreds of millions of people, but they are in fact corporate actors that have accountability, um, both in the countries that they're registered in, but also in the countries in which they are disrupting democracies. And I think what's so incredible about whether we're looking at the issue of caste discrimination or the issue of genocide, Silicon Valley companies have taken a very loose and irresponsible approach about how they entered the Indian market um, without competencies, without regard for the rule of law, simply in order to corner the market and get as many people to be able to um, come onto their product. And that might make good business sense, but it actually makes for bad democracy. And in particular, the thing that I'm so incensed about is this question of Facebook and what it has done in India. And I think what's really important for people to consider is that this is not just a partisan issue and we shouldn't be talking about it simply in the realm of political parties. Because the reality is, is that anyone who contributes to genocide should be accountable for it. That includes individuals, that includes states, and it includes organizations, and very critically in this context, corporations. And I think the questions we need to be asking ourselves as civil society is what is Facebook's role in contributing to the genocidal crisis that we're dealing with right now in India, particularly um, in the context of the Citizenship Amendment Act and the general uh, you know, falling apart of, of the fabric of Indian society. And when people are trying to think about, well, how, how long is this problem? When did it all start? And I really want to remind people that, you know, in 2013, 2013, before Modi was elected, there was the Musafnagar riots. And for people that remember those riots, there, you know, there were many that were killed, 50,000 that were rendered homeless. That was the first incidence of mass atrocity that was started with content on Facebook and also WhatsApp. Facebook knew that the content started on their platform. And again, they did nothing. And in other contexts, whenever you have that significant of a collective atrocity happen on the platform, they should have paused operations and immediately done a human rights audit to understand their impact in the company of record. They did not do that. And in fact, instead of not assessing the dangerousness of their operations, they actually went into the business of elections into the Indian market. And to know how partisan that effort was, I think you have to also know who was the person that was responsible for it on the US side. It was this woman named Katie Harbutt, who ran Rudy Giuliani's campaign, you know, who's one of Trump's henchmen now um, in New York City. And then she also was the Republican digital strategist for, uh, for three years. So she took a very, they took a very partisan right-wing actor in the United States to basically supervise the entry of Facebook into the elections of multiple countries. That includes India, the Philippines and Germany. And in those countries where Katie did her work, we saw each of those countries go towards the right. India got Modi, Philippines got Duarte, and we saw that in Germany, the rise of the right-wing Nazi party, AFD. Again, during this time was also the time that Facebook was also working with Cambridge Analytica. And for Global North countries, there was congressional hearings, there was parliamentary hearings in the EU, 
why did we not talk in the Indian context of the role of elections operations in that Facebook had from 2013 onward? Because again, if we see that severe of an interference and that global North countries are upset about it, why was our country in the Indian context completely silent? That's how long this process has gone. And I think that what's very important when we talk about you know, one of the key figures that's surrounding this debate, Anki Das, Anki Das was at the core of it. Anki Das, who was hired in 2011, was the person who was doing the first Facebook workshops and finding out who should be brought onto the platform first. We have no transparency who, uh, what groups Anki Das worked with and also what was the role of Facebook in the 2013, 2014 elections. This is key information we need to have in terms of accountability because we will get a sense of how much change in their interference in the Indian election process. Until we get that data, we are all in a black box of Facebook bias, incompetency and failure of duty of care for our people. And this is fundamentally the thing I want people to lead with is that India didn't just overnight turn into a hotbed of hate speech and genocidal context. It was pushed there by a corporate actor that made money off of genocidal hate speech. And we have a right as a users to address that. Because again, when we think about this timeline, once Modi was in power, the other things that we saw was a general decline of hate speech, right? Uh, general decline of democracy, general polarization of society, and also uh, an inability to actually control hate speech that was actually against the law towards minorities, like the Prevention of Atrocity Act, that became normalized because it was so often to see CASA slurs or Muslim slurs or slurs against women. Keep in mind that the hashtag prostitute originated on Facebook and Twitter and was never removed, even though it led to the murder of Gauri Lankesh and so many other journalists that have been targeted on this platform simply because they are doing their jobs to report. So also what's very critical is that from 2016 to 2017 was the Myanmar genocide. And that's what's very important is that while Indian democracy was declining, Facebook already created the conditions for genocide in another country where Rohingya, again, were called cockroaches and termites. They were banned and faced lots of you know, uh, physical assault and violence, including economic boycotts. They were also eventually denaturalized and revoked their citizenship. And then from there, put into camps and eventually rendered stateless and leading to this very violent um, you know, uh, process of diasporic um, refugee ship. And the thing that was so critical is understanding what was Facebook's role. Facebook's role in that context was one, they allowed genocidal hate speech without any accountability. Two, they never translated their hate speech guidelines into Burmese, so people didn't know what violations were, and the reporting mechanisms and the policy team that was supposed to protect users were not on the job because they did not have enough language competency. So they already knew in 2016 and 2017 that their platform not only led to mass atrocity like Musafnagar, but also to genocide. And the situation was so severe, Mark Zuckerberg apologized for it, and then they began a process of remedy in that market. And that's really where I think a lot of civil society across South Asia saw that Rohingya hate speech was going to become a lightning rod in our own context and that we needed to fight this and also fight the turn towards genocidal hate speech. Because the thing that we also need to acknowledge is that it's not simply a war of words. This is not simply partisan debate. We are seeing genocidal hate speech on the level of Radio Rwanda type content that was used in the Rwandan genocide as normal speech now by many actors across the, um, the sector of the right wing in the South Asian context. And that is actually against the law. And it is also against Facebook's own guidelines. So when they allow it, they are actually failing their duty of care to our people. And that's what we need to understand. This is not an issue of competency. They actually have tons of people at this point from civil society to other governmental actors who are seeing the crisis of hate speech and violence coming out of Facebook India and they don't know why 
the company is not doing anything. They know about it in the context of Menlo Park. They know about it in the context of their headquarters of Delhi. Every time you bring up this issue to them, they have some excuse. Well, oh, we don't have the right AI and we need to have more slur lists. All of this is sleights of hand because actually they know what the problem is, but they benefit off making money off the blood of our people. And if we aren't angry about that, then we have been trained too well under English colonial masters to accept Silicon Valley colonial masters who are making money as hundreds of millions of people are on the chopping block and set to deal with genocidal violence. And this is really time for us to be people of courage because in our work at Equality Labs, we have raised the issue of Rohingya level hate speech to the platform. We did a public report that shared that 93% of all hate speech posts report to, reported to Facebook remain on Facebook. And 100% of all restored hate speech, because again, some people may be like, well, okay, at least I'm trying to report. Even if you report it, often the hate speech comes back and 100%, according to our data, of all restored hate speech was Islamophobic in nature. And that to me is an incredible problem because it's not our job to fix the problems of a multi-billion dollar company, it's their job. And things that we know that Facebook failed in our context is one, they did not provide localization of community guidelines. They actually were asking people to donate their time to translate them, which itself is like nonsense but also for civil society to have been raising this issue for over four years. And now the only time that they're saying that they're addressing it is because there's an expose in the Wall Street Journal it is negligent, it's offensive, and also we need to act. Because fundamentally, a Silicon Valley company cannot do business in our context if we don't want to do business with them. And we need to not let this simply become a debate between political parties, because the, this is not just a partisan issue. This is about an American company that went into India, disrupted its democracy at the highest level, and then allowed genocidal hate speech that continuously have put Muslims and Dalits and Christians and Sikhs deeply at risk. And that to me as a Dalit person is unacceptable because I, I myself have gotten rape threats and death threats on the platform. And when I saw that there was no inactivity, this wasn't an issue of one bad apple or one post. It's a systemic problem. It's not an engineering problem. It has to do with Facebook making a calculus about who is going to get them into power, who will allow them to get them the policies they need to maintain power, and how will they look um, at the achievable collateral damage of our democracies, as well as minorities, in terms of the balance of them making money. And that to me um, is such an atrocious, atrocious decision that they made that really this needs to be dealt with, not just with Anki Das, but we need to take Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg to task. Because Sheryl Sandberg has no problem leaning in when it gives her power. Well, let's lean into Sheryl Sandberg and ask her, what does she think about the fact that we have genocidal hate speech in its largest market? And that's the most of the other thing I want to really leave people is that this may be an American company, but Facebook India is now Facebook's largest market on both Facebook, WhatsApp, and also soon Instagram. And because of that, we have a power. And I really want to encourage civil society and just the regular folks that are on this, um, this, this, uh, this panel today to say, we have the power to act. We may not have the political ability to move all the things that we need within the judiciary or in the parliament, but the world is standing with Indians right now because they are seeing the shit show that Facebook has done. And we don't need to buy any of their like talking points about we're doing our jobs and look at how hard it is. It is actually easy because you just have to look at Anki Das's own talks about countering violent extremism and what they've done to remove Muslim extremist um, content off the platform. If you contrast her statements there about how easy that is and how many pieces of content and all the algorithms and things that they built, you just have to go back to Anki. Well, Anki, you've built this for, you know, these extremists, are we really looking at all of the right wing actors we need to be looking at in the Indian context? And you know what you'll hear? You will hear crickets. 
because again, the question here is not a technical failure. It's not a policy failure. It's a failure of political bias. And that requires us to really think about how do we look at this not as an issue of simply policy, but really one of power building. And, and we know that in some of our other work in Silicon Valley, particularly since we work on the issue of caste discrimination in tech, we are seeing so many companies who operate in the Valley, who also operate in India, have massive offices in India, because again, our market is so crucial to them because they are locked out of the Chinese market. So the future of their companies is in India and in South Asia. One in four people in the world are South Asian, one in six people in the world are Indian. So if we think that the power lies in California, then that is the limit of our own radical imagination. We have the power here and we need to start holding these companies accountable as opposed to imagining them as our techno utopian overlords that are gonna give us the blueprint of the future. The blueprint of our future around the issues of privacy, around the issues of tech equity will lie with civil society and with normal people like you and me. And we have a right to be able to ground that in human rights, not their bottom line. And that's why it's so critical for us to unite and and really use this moment to hold Facebook to task and also build power for all of us, but most particularly for caste oppressed and religious minorities in our context. Because again, we are in a genocidal moment. And the question people are going to ask us when they look back at this moment in history is did we do everything to stop it? And when we look at, for example, other companies like IBM and their role in the Jewish Holocaust, we know that Mark Zuckerberg will go down in history for the failure of what he's done in our country. And it's our job to get to that pathway. 